So we're on to chapter 12 now. We are talking about Romanesque art. And um, just want to set the stage a little bit at first about the culture that it's all, what's going on in the world, how people are thinking and what they're kind of doing. And also look at a few of the special kind of power structures that are at play. So during this time period, much of Europe is a patchwork of regions rather than like nations with central capitals. And the church is very large, prosperous, and has lots of power in buildings, and they're very stable. So there's very much a connection of power between like the Catholic Church and states. Monasteries own tracts of land that are really large and huge amounts of um, wealth in that way. And then this Romanesque idea is Roman-like. That's what it's based off of. The idea of the name of it is based off of that term Romanesque is referring to Roman-like. It refers to like a wide range of regional variants and style. It's more of a stylistic term. So we have this type of term, there's terms in, in the world of academia that are more historical terms, um, like Revolutionary War or something like that. And then there's ones that are more stylistic. And this one for art would be like a stylistic term. Due to the patchwork nature of the world at this time in Europe, they kind of sometimes have regional names attached to them, like Norman Romanesque to talk about Northern France, Normandy, um, other things like that. So it means Roman-like, and it's about a description of a shared features from Roman architecture, actual Roman architecture that filtered into this. So things like circular round arches, vaulting, exterior relief on the buildings, all of that type of stuff, the way that that influenced European building during this period of time, which is quite a while that we'll look at. In society in general, we're talking about a feudal society. So that's Latin for oath. It's a society that's based upon kingship and systems of power, power and loyalty. We talked about this a bit in chapter 11, but it becomes even stronger during this time period. And it's a political, social, economic even ordering of society that's based on loyalty and not social mobility. There's a very, very strong class system. So we have at the top kings and each level gives something and receives something. So. You'll notice even at the bottom they're giving something and they're supposed to be receiving something. The problem is the further down the, the ranks you get, then the contract starts to break down even more and more. So in the first level with the lords, nobles, lords, we could be talking about lords, barons, bishops. They're over like a fiefdom, an area. And then we have the vassal. So those are the real noble nobles below the kings. And we have their vassals or knights. They're sort of like the war band for their lords. And they serve and protect. And they get land for themselves in exchange. So these guys, the nobles, are giving uh, money and their armies to the king. The king gives them fiefdoms. And then they give land down to their knights and vassals and they give them back their military service to the war bands so the king's taking taxes basically from the bottom up the whole way and the knights are supposed to be giving protection to their people underneath them the peasants and land for them to farm but they have to give back a sort of tax in food and service and the problem is a lot of times they're not getting very good protection and they're having to give so much food and service they're living in a really difficult, bad situation down at the bottom. 
So we have this group here called peasants or also called serfs. Um, they're tied to the land and they're very, 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 very difficult lives compared to the people at the top of the pyramid. So that kind of gives the basic overview of the way society is functioning um, economically and governmentally. We also have during this time though little changes happening in this because there's beginning to be the rise of towns. From about a thousand to eleven hundred cities and towns are growing with the movements of pilgrims and crusades and this kind of created a situation where before they may have had people who peddle their wares or have a trade and they move about to work for different people could now stay put long enough to actually set up a shop because people were coming through on a journey to particular places like we talked a bit about with um, in the last chapter how there were different places that had important relics where people would be on pilgrimages to that type of thing and this was very common so they could set up shop and really get more power and wealth and to some extent they begin to have like trade unions a version of it eventually so cities have charters from kings or lords so the actual king or lord would set them up and there would be localized power like mayors and things in some cases so this is quite a big change in in history of the world really to think about the starting of cities we kind of assume in a way that they've always been this is just how things are, but no, there was time where that wasn't the case. Another really important part of, of civilization, society, Europe at this time, is chivalry. So the word comes from cheval, which is horse in French, and knights had horses and rode on horses. It's really a code of conduct or behavior for knights, and it's for and about the aristocratic elite. So, the elite up here. Um, it was begun by Pope Urban II, who preached for a need for that during the Crusades to free Jerusalem. He preached for the Crusades to go and take Jerusalem back from the Islamic um, Empire. And it was talking, his ideas about it were about being brave, true, loyal, and honorable to people and careful for people who are weaker than them, who have less power, and also um, for women as well. And I don't think you could say pretty clearly based on looking at history with the Crusades and the type of stuff that was happening, people carried that out um, very well. I mean, there were some people who were very chivalrous and acted very well, but many of them, you know, took advantage of, of their power. So out of this idea springs what we would call courtly love. And that is basically... The ideal, the idealized devotion of knights to a, a lady, it's very much about the upper class. And um, in the upper classes, marriages were arranged for money and status. So sometimes the lords would be away on crusades and they would leave behind some knights to protect their castle and things like that. And what would happen is a bunch of affairs and trysts and love triangles and all this type of stuff so uh, you get some of that in like King Arthur's tale of Lancelot and Guinevere and all these type of things so this is very much part of the upper class at this time it's a real thing that really happened another thing that was very 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 much a uh, huge part of society for a very long time were the Crusades there were at least six of them depending on how you count them so six of them. Why did they have them? Well, we'll look about pretty soon here, in just a moment, about things like pilgrimage and monasteries and traveling the pilgrim roads to Jerusalem, especially. 
So they wanted to make the safe travel paths to Jerusalem so that people could go on pilgrimage there. That was the reason why we had the Pope preaching for it. And to take back what they would call the holy city from um, people who weren't Christians. But really, you could say below the surface, crusades were really for economic benefits to gain political zones and conquest to have huge amounts of extra land and money and wealth flowing in. And really on the lower levels with knights and things, there was also an even bearing and all these guys, an excuse to loot and pillage places and take from other people. Um, an example of this is like Constantinople. We've talked a lot about that place, Istanbul, modern day. It was looted in a crusade even though it was a Christian city and people there weren't in the military ranks, the opposite, the enemy military ranks. They were looting it because they were out on crusade to loot, okay? So what we got from the crusades ultimately was pretty rough. Um, it's hard to see much good from them. There was a lot of really negative, negative, negative things back then and also even now to hostilities and the way people... If you use the word crusade in the wrong context, that could be really, really negative, for example, because it's so loaded as a history. But there were some ideas of maybe we got some exchange of ideas, ultimately, despite all the intensity. There was a broaden, broadening of the horizons of people traveling who probably never would have traveled out of their own even area, village, you know, county. And then... We did get an example of knowledge we'll see in the next chapter and a little bit in this one of like uh, the arch changing from a round arch. So that's the round, you know, arch to a pointed arch. That's kind of bad drawing on the stream. Anyway, you get the idea. And that was architecturally has a big impact for being able to build higher and things. We'll see a lot of that in chapter 13, which is the Gothic art chapter. So sometimes I have to watch a documentary about art of the Western world, Romanesque, and there's some good stuff in it, but there's no way for me to really easily show that to you. So I'm going to post um, another documentary I want you to watch in this module kind of reassert some of these ideas for you. Another huge part of society, similar to chapter 11, was pilgrimage. So if you remember from chapter 11, we talked about what is the definition of pilgrimage? Well, it is, drum roll please, you will remember probably here, hopefully, Someone out there is saying it already, and we will say it is a journey taken for a religious reason. Why doesn't that go bigger? Oh, that's a bummer. I'll have to do it like this next time. A journey. Taking for a religious reason. Pilgrimage. So there's a lot of this happening. And this next place we're going to be looking at is on the Pilgrim Road in southern France. There was a main, one of the main sites of pilgrimage from was Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Compostela. Um, it was one of, besides like the two holiest sites in pilgrimage in Christendom, were Jerusalem and Rome for Christians. Well, this is one of the other very, very lar large destinations that people would go to. And it was a city way up here on the edge of northwest Spain. And it was on what they call the Camino de Santiago, the way of St. James. Forgive my Spanish, it's bad. Um, and it was a church all the way out here where the remains of St. James 
uh, are said to be buried. So, James, the brother of Jesus. Okay, so let's see. So, there were all these different cathedrals and towns that had miniature stopping spots and monasteries where people would stay and see other relics and big cathedrals on their way. And one of the big ones was here in southern France, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Um, in these places, they would have relics and things for an illuminated manuscripts. You can see right there. Um, on display for people to uh, see on their way on the journey. And, like, they wanted to go to relics and journey to places that had them. So it was very important for a lot of these churches to have something like that. So it's a piece of something a relic is. A piece of something. Piece of something. What could it be? A finger bone. Something they owned. Cloth. Clothing. All kinds of things. Okay? That was owned by a holy, holy in quotes, holy person, a person who has some kind of position, not necessarily like, for example, in the Christian church at this time, back then, it wouldn't necessarily be something owned by Jesus, but by one of the apostles or a bunch of other things. But there were some things that they were saying were the nails of the true cross or a piece of the true cross. We'll look at that later too. Um, by true cross, they mean the one that Jesus was crucified on. So there was this idea back then that um, people could atone for sin by penance, by acting, by doing something. And so they would need to have pay penance to go to these places, go on this journey to um, see these relics or something like that would be part of it. And, and then later it kind of became a custom of the devoted people who were um, cared about it to go to these places too. So it's kind of a mixed bag of different reasons. There were, like I said, a lot of monasteries would be built along these routes and as well as big churches so that people could stay there as they're moving throughout. And there was a network of them, and there was quite a lot of money associated with this. You can kind of get these ideas in Chaucer's like Canterbury Tales and things like that. Um, albeit not exactly this area. So one of these roads went through, like we said right here, this town. This town. And the pilgrimage really, really affected the architecture of these big churches because they became really, really large compared to this is the city right here that it would be in not very large of a city. I think he said it's Conque France. Conque France, not really a huge population, but there is a really, really large cathedral. You can see how big that cathedral is in comparison. Um, and we kind of begin to see also the architecture uh, changing to accommodate large crowds. And then changing for other stylistic reasons, so becoming really big because of that. So this piece, this piece of architecture is called Saint Foy. It was dedicated to Saint Faith, Saint Foy, a third century martyr who refused to worship pagan gods and was still a child when she was mar martyred. So the cathedral is over her tomb, her burial site. So. What matters to us about this particular place is that it's um, the earliest surviving pilgrimage church example. It was a religious building, a cathedral, a type of church. It's made out of stone. It's, um, we could say it's rectangular basilica inspired, but it's not the exact original basilica look. It's starting to become the difference we'll see between it and the Latin style cross format will start to be shown. So we have here coming up like the walk up to the cathedral front where the two towers are. 
And we're coming up to the portal, which is the door to the cathedral. But I kind of want to show you before that the floor plan difference. So this is the Basilica floor plan way back that we've seen for a really long time, right? Where we have this crossing transept, but it's way smaller and further up. This is beginning to be like, if you look from the top, like the shape of a cross. It's way bigger. The apse is expanding. And you're getting a lot more aisles, a much larger crossing. And then you're beginning to get these giant towers associated with it as well. So they're getting pretty complex. Um, extra side chapels and ambulatories. And so a place where people can walk around the whole outside and see things while a service is still happening. Areas for choirs. So getting more complex. So we're going to look back up to um, the front of it for a second, too, here before we go further in. Is they'll see the two towers, of course, and then we're going to look specifically at this area above the door, though, real quick. When you see in front of it, there's these two towers. You can kind of get the idea quickly that there's a lot of grandeur, an impression of, you know, think about. You can't think with a modern modern mind about this. I mean, it's hard to put ourselves out, outside of this, but even now when you go to these buildings, it's very grand, very amazing. Well, in this case back then, there's even more of a grandeur because, you know, there's not as many skyscrapers and tall buildings and all the things we kind of maybe, some of the things we take for granted don't exist. So this is very, 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 very different. Uh, type of architecture than the average day run-of-the-mill architecture. So this is the facade in the front face of the building. It was also used as defensive watchtower in case of, you know, invaders. And it houses the portal of the cathedral, which is the main door that you enter into. They're going to look at this specific area above the door that has a lot of decoration and relief sculpture on it. So this is us getting closer up to it. There's actually names for all the pieces of the doors of the portal or port the portal of the cathedral. There's the lintel, which we know post and lintel. This area, the tympanum, is what we're going to look at here. And then there's vizors, there's the jams, and trume, which often these things have all kinds of carving on them as well. And certain cathedrals. So all this stuff archi architecturally is labeled. Um, the door is like I said just not just the door but are all of these architectural things that the composition around it and the sculpture here was really designed to communicate with people because we're living in a we're living in an age where people are illiterate okay so they're not all reading. Most people can't read. To read is a rarity. So they really want to communicate ideas. And this idea is, if you think about it, right above the door on your way in, is something everyone's going to see, right? They're all going to see it on the way in. And it's about the last judgment of Christ. So it's an act. An act to put this here is a reminder of the shortness of life and then the ideas of punishment or reward reward waiting upon your choices at the end. It's made out of stone. Oops, I don't want to skip ahead so far. Quick. Um, it was probably originally fully painted. You can see a little bit of that left on there still. So there's traces of it left. It's definitely gotten away over time. So... In the middle of it is Christ. Let's see if we can get a close up. And he's acting as the judge of souls to either go to heaven or hell. So this is pretty intense imagery here. Um, during this time in in the world, in the world here, in this place and this time, there's very, very, very intense um, way of preaching and looking at 
heaven and hell and stuff we'll be talking about, which many people um, still believe in today. It's fine. Not a critique of that, but just a warning to let you know we're going to be uh, jumping into that type of an idea here. So in the middle is Christ, and he defi he is here in the middle, and you can see his hands are sort of like up or down, whatever way you're moving, so to speak. There's a metaphor of down being hell and up being heaven, that they're using, um, to communicate those ideas. And it's the figures on the viewer's left here, or Christ, if you're in his position, his right hand side, are saints and churchmen and people who are, you know, been redeemed and going to heaven. So this whole piece very much conforms to like iconographic norms. We've talked about that before a lot as an idea that certain types of pieces are, and even we looked at Egyptians in general, there are ancient Egyptian, I should say, there's very much like a certain particular way that there's a way, a norm of how they do it. Well, this one very much illustrates that. So we're going to talk about it a little bit more in detail because of that reason. And it's an early, early example. So there's these people on Christ's right, our left, if we're looking at it, are, are people. And above we get some ideas, angels holding scrolls. Do I have a picture of that? Different people like this showing the saints coming in. That's all this layer down here. It's hard to see. I don't have a lot of good pictures of it, but up here, there's a pic there's angels who are like sh blasting trumpets and holding scrolls above them as well. See, these are angels. Um, and then below, there's an the idea of purgatory maybe happening. People moving up, but they're still redeemed. This is um, not as much purgatory, but the arches. This is part of heaven, I should say, first. And then over to his left, over here, which is our right, facing it, there's ideas of purgatory and then hell. So these people are lo lowered and being tortured. by demons and the devil here down here at the bottom is a personification imagery of personification is not the right word a uh, basic image of what some artist has decided that the the devil looks like um jumbled together with snakes you can see snakes coming through here and on the other side is angels welcome the saved to heaven the grotesque devil figures um, are welcoming them to hellishness basically you can see right up here they're beginning that process right over here welcoming them down they've been moving down sort of and here he's welcoming them to hell with a big club on the other side it's something else happening right much happier and he's shoving them through this kind of beast that you're going to see right there, out the other side. And there's a, a close-up of, of the devil, the imagery of the devil. So this is the idea of the jaws. Well, I can't get a good image of it, I'm sorry. The jaws of death or hell gates of hell and jaws of death sort of going on here is imagery you see a lot happening so you can see that there's sort of very organizational things that are common about it you have a center line up and down and there's these panels that kind of keep it in check and see there's a divisions i guess you should say of different things happening on each side and they're kind of in boxes you could say okay there's a lot of figures but if you see around it is a whole box that's kind of broken up with a little theme in each area so that's how the artist organized it so this is that gates of hell jaws of death see there's even imagery of a gate or an opening here and then another door being welcomed into life so pretty strong um, visual visuals about 
what's waiting for you here, right? Um, this is definitely a meant to be a visual lesson in like what are you doing, where are you going in life, which in certain ways maybe um, people even now today would feel about looking at this type of thing to question the type of choices they're making when they go to cathedrals and things like that. So still strong even today. We see in this that sculpture came back into Christian architecture. So there was, we talked about iconoclasm in chapter 11, that fear of idolatry in biblical imagery and in sculpture. Um, that's beginning, we talked about this with Charlemagne and how he was having it now afterwards. Um, in, in the Byzantine Empire, there was that iconoclasm taking over. Well, it's beginning to come back now, so they're not... They kind of dispelled that fear, and they're back at it. So I kind of want to talk and look at the outside of this to show you. This was the port portal. They're walking in. There's a still long main aisle called the nave, which is like a really long nave all the way to the apse where the focus of the service with Eucharist communion would be. There's a crossing tower, and these are the two front towers that have bells, too, that would call people to Mass and things. But we want to look at the floor plan a tiny bit longer and break down some of the other things now that we're getting deeper into it. Um, St. Floyd does not have a traditional courtyard area. It's on the street, so to speak. So its entrance is into open space, whereas the Basilica would have the atrium okay that's very different um this is like the meet and greet maybe a fountain we're looking at just going straight into the street right here the narthex is the entrance hall before the main building of the church there's that here and they had that also on the basilica the narthex so they both have one of those um the nave on both of them here is the long central aisle and we have a nave here too, so that's quite similar. And then we have side aisles, that co columns that separate from the nave on each side. We have those over here, and also on the here, these are side aisles, so that's common as well. And in the basilica, we had the transept, which you knew. That's the transept, the crossing thing. There's one of these two on this St. Foy that's becoming like a Latin cross as well. But if you see here, it's getting a lot wider, a lot, lot wider. And it's giving the overall ground plan the shape of the cross as it widens out and changes the building. Okay, so that's a huge difference. And then they both have the apse, the end of the nave, where the main focus of the service would be. Um, and But we see on this one, a bunch of semicircular little niches, right? At the end of the nave. This is still opposite of the entrance on both of them, right? So the whole building, the aisles, everything is kind of leading to this point in the building. So that's still the case. It's where the altar is located in the focal point of the building. But they're kind of adding more to it with the ambulatories and things like that. So there's and they made it a lot bigger here. If you see the size, it's a lot bigger. So very, very different in certain ways and also still keeping some of it and just adapting and changing and pushing it a little bit to expand it for their purposes for pilgrimage and different types of things like that. Also going to say about this before we start looking at the inside is that the central aisle when we look at the inside, it's going to have a really high roof line. And then um, the side aisles are going to have a lower roof line. So that's going to be a kind of a change from earlier things that we've seen. And then the transept area, there's also other little side areas for the clergy and visitors who cannot circulate around. Like the visitors could circulate around and not mess with the service. Well, these are areas where the clergy could use them. Um, and not, they wouldn't disturb the main choir area as they were moving around the pilgrims and things. So that's a, that's a big change too. They're using the architecture, changing the architecture, I'd say, not using 
to help them do what they want to do for the service and have be able to allow um, pilgrims to come through. And then that's the big crossing tower you've been seeing right on the outside. There's a giant tower at the crossing point. So this shows you that high roof line of the nave and then see how there's lower roof lines throughout the place. The apse, these parts off of the apse, they're a little lower down. So just wanted to show you that too. In this place, this is looking down the nave aisle, it's pretty amazing. This is the high, high roof with the crossing tower looking at the apse. So we're talking about really, really grand spaces. I mean, people are in them and they're looking up at the giant, giant spaces. What do you suppose the meaning of it is? I mean, think for a minute about it before I say anything. Is like, why would they make spaces so big like this? Um, it's all about the feeling of yourself. If you're here, this is a table, so you're tiny in relationship to it, being very small, right? And these are religious buildings, so there's a type of awe that happens when something's so large, so much larger than you. Um, and it makes sense when you think about it because, you know, that's part of the purpose of this building and the service is that ideas of God and thing, and awe and holiness and reverence. So to make the architecture match that, use those ideas by the scale of it is going to be, you know, an intentional choice that they're making. So we can see inside here also the rounded arches that are happening, the Roman-like rounded arches. And there's a hundred feet unbroken line from the portal down to the apse, which is pretty amazing length of an open space. Pretty awesome. This emphasizes and leads people's eye up to the front of the building. And in a sense, you could say this is also the idea of leading the eye up the space. So these are the rounded arches. Up to the focal point of the soul being led to heaven too by the repetition of these arches and this long space and light coming in from up high. We've talked about how light is used as a symbol for God's presence. So leading the eye down the space and um, the light and the round repetition is an idea of leading the heaven, the soul to focus on heaven. So we have the first story, which is the arcade. These are this is the whole area. Um, these are like the main architectural supporting elements and they're a row down the nave. This is what we're talking about here. The second story up here is like a gallery that you can look down, not like an art gallery, but they call these galleries. You can look down, stand and look down on the service from up above. This is looking up at it directly. So you can look down from up here, can accommodate a lot of people. And then the ceiling above, looking straight up at the ceiling here, is from barrel vaulting. It's very heavy in weight. And there's these ribs that are arches made out of stone, like that. And they support this huge amount of weight. Um, they were built first, like this, and then the rest of the vaulting system lies upon them. And they're built with really big foundations on the end so they don't push out. Um, this is what makes these buildings so intense feeling and big. And they're not very light feeling. Romex is a little heavier. It gets lighter later because of different things we'll talk about in Chapter 13. But they replaced um, wood ones that earlier in the migration area. Less chance of fire. And there was... A lot better acoustics in these churches with the giant open spaces of stone, which there was a lot of chanting back then in the music, Gregorian chanting and things. So having that acoustic quality is very important to them. Then the side aisles off of it have the lower roof line, like I talked to you guys about and showed you from the outside. Um, and they extend all the way around 
the transept, which is that crossing aisle as well, and the apse for clergy and visitor clergy back here where visitors could not go, and they wouldn't disrupt this whole area. So it's all designed for this new sort of pilgrimage is a huge part of the design, the in, the influx of pilgrims. So we're looking right here at the apse, um, which is where the altar for the uh, Eucharist would be served, the communion. And there's a little different types of um, vaulting that they use in this place. A lot of it is based off of the idea of making arches over and over again. So barrel arches. They used to use, we'll see in some different things we'll look at, they use these centering uh, construction rigs out of wood to keep it centered while they've added all the pieces and then they have the keystone at the top keeps it together and then they're really important posts they kind of operate in a way like a more advanced post and lintel right i think i talked to you guys about this before but you know post and lintel you're just talking about here's the lintel here's the post right if there's a lot of weight here well then it breaks right away if you see this right here the weight goes down in the middle and it gets pushed down a little bit more. So it's more, um, it's a better way of distributing the weight. So you can get higher buildings without breaking, having to have a giant, giant lintel that would maybe break otherwise. So hopefully that makes sense to you. We're going to look at the crossing tower for a second. This is the interior view of that big tower where the transept and the nave cross and the lets in a little, quite a bit of light, but not as much as we'll see in chapter 13. So that's the interior view of it, really, really grand. And in some way we could say it rises above the structure as an idea of like reaching up high to God, up to the light, is like the visual metaphor and the idea behind it. Um, it's using the idea of drawing vaulting here going on, a system that directs weight of heavy stones down from between the windows. See the groin vaulting? I don't know if I have, here it is. See how it crosses over? It directs the weight down so you could have windows. And you see how it directs it down and down and down all the time. All the weights. And it thickens up and gets thicker and thicker as the building goes down. Called buttressing to allow for really height without it breaking. Um, a large allows for larger windows to have these types of vaulting. So that's how you get those. This is the exterior view of the windows. So it's really about this idea of reaching up high to the heavens, reaching towards God, these kind of buildings. They have much of that type of symbolism when they're literally reaching up high to the heavens also. So just to reinforce that idea, there's that cross groin vaulting that's happening in there. And as I said, Gregorian chanting was really, really important for them in their religious um, services. Pope Gregory the Great of 600 AD, it's a music for prayer and complication, contemplation. You've probably heard it before, maybe. Uh, very like a cappella, which means no instruments, usually all male voices. Back then it was all male voices. It's called stepwise progression of notes. That gives a slow, plodding mood. And it's very hypnotic, if you've heard it before. So that was part of the acoustics. If you imagine it echoing around the reverb in this giant building, even with a lot of people in it, that created an environment that worked really well for that. So that kind of takes us through the actual um, cathedral building. Well, in the cathedral, there was a relic, an important relic, and we're going to look at that relic. Okay, so let's spend a minute looking at the um, relic, the main big relic at this place. This is at the um, the same church we've been looking at in uh, France. So it's a reliquary statue of Saint Foy, Saint Faith. It's the reason they came to the cathedral. It's named after her. It's where her 
where they think her grave was or where they said it was. And this is the relic associated with this saint, which is the cathedral is named after as well. So this is like one of the important objects for them here. The most important. So it's said to maybe be formed around her skull. And you'll see it's actually kind of a large head for the size of a body. And then it's a third century, she was a third century martyr who refused to worship pagan gods. You remember we talked about that at the beginning of looking at the cathedral. So she was a martyr. A martyr means to be killed for your beliefs, right? Somebody who was killed for their faith in this example. She didn't want to worship the other gods that people wonder to, so she was killed because of it. It's made out of gold, and there's a lot of gemstones in it as well. So really, really richly decorated. And this technique, we've talked about it before. Um, we looked at some ancient Aegean things like Mask of Agamemnon, where they heat up and form sheets of gold. In that case, it was one sheet of gold. It's called repoussé. So it's spelled this way in case you want to know. I'll pull up this little text area if you type things. Repoussé. Technique of hammering the gold sheets. It has a sense of aloof power is what they say about it. And you can kind of feel that the saint's really not looking at you in some way that feels welcoming necessarily in the facial expression. This is really large head. They say it was a, maybe a reused mask, so the facial mask might have been reused. Um, that's what they most likely think, so it's extra large. And you can see, we're looking at the side of her. She has earrings. And look at all the details here of all the gemstones. And you can kind of see where, you, when you're close up, how it was hammered. There's like a feeling of it being beaten into shape. She wears the martyr's crown, so she has a crown on her head, that's why, because martyrs have crowns, um, and a robe also that's of a martyr, so the robe and crown. She's sitting frontally focused, so on a kind of throne as well. Um, enthroned means on a throne, right? So she's giving a lot of, giving her a lot of homage, and it's very rich golden robe full of jewels, and the only thing that's sort of welcoming about her, her facial expression not super welcoming, is her arms. Her hands and her arms are open to welcome pilgrims. So it's very much a gesture of come and see me pilgrims, like come hither, a welcoming gesture. It's not super um, realistic in any way, right? We look at it, we're like, okay, it's naturalistic, it looks like a person, the ears and eyes and things are in the right spot. But, you know, the eyes are very strangely, not a lot of depth, there's depth, but then all of a sudden the eyes are like flat, black and white on this golden face. The ears are looking pretty accurate. So there's some kind of a little bit of a feeling of anatom anatomy, anatomical accuracy, but not really, not really super accurate. But naturalism, more and more or less, as we see things in the real world. Um, the scale of her overall of her body, though, is not. Look how big this head is. The height of a head one. It's like one, two, and a half. Yeah. If that's the size of her head, she's got a really large head compared to her body. So that's extra large. That's not realistic either. Frontal focus on the face, too, so that's understandable in a way. But... We're going to look at some other reliquaries um, that are famous. This is medieval Romanesque from around that time period. This is an interesting one, also medieval Romanesque from around 1100. Um, this name, Savala, is a place in Belgium. It's a triptych reliquary, which means three panels. One, two, three. But they all belong together as one piece. So you see this sometime in other art with three paintings that are together. But a lot of there's a lot of altar pieces from this era and later that are in triptychs like that. 
So this would be placed on display in a church for the faithful to pray before, not to it, but in front of it. Important distinction for them. And pilgrims would travel to these type of places to pray. This picture is just to show you the scale next to a person. It was a devotional object. This is a function, a devotional object for an altar. And it communi communicates to pilgrims about the establishment of Christianity as the main religion of Rome and Jerusalem. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at these rondolas about. So there's an idea of communicating that Rome and Jerusalem are the main main sites of Christianity. That's what it's establishing. And then by proxy or association because of this reliquary and those two places, they're trying to communicate the idea that Savalot is also a main site because of it. So there's a sort of like backdoor sneaking it in type of thought here about okay, these two places are really important, so, and we have this thing about them, so we're really important too. We talked about this before a number of times, but uh, reliquary, this is the reliquary, this whole contraption, just like, oops, that was the reliquary for St. Foy. The reliquary houses the relic, so relics are so important, that they can't be touched. And because they're so important, just like we talked about with illuminated manuscripts, they deserve to be in really finely made and beautiful objects. Like the objects, the relic themselves, deserve to be in a really finely made object, a reliquary. Just like we talked about with the jeweled covers on the gospel books that people had. Like it was an important book for them. Um, super, super, the contents are super important, so it deserves to be in a treasure binding. Well, same thing going on here. So, it's protected by it and given importance by it. Um, and like I said before, it's remains of things from holy persons or saints, clothing they had, items they owned or touched, or physical, actual physical remains of their body. This one's made out of gilded which means gold leaf over bronze, and it has precious gemstones, and these are enamel inlays. There's some other enamel inlays, which is like um, glass melted on. So the enamel inlays on the right here, these are what we're talking about, these round sections. They um, are said to be about the life of Helena, who was Constantine's mother. And if you remember, that um, Constantine's super important because he is the one who legalized Christianity in 312 AD, right? The Edict of Milan. And on the other side is about Constantine himself. Uh, from the bottom up, it's talking about his vision, right? We were in this sign you will conquer, his victory at the bridge, here he is fighting. And then his baptism, he's being uh, submerged in water here at the top. So he had a vision, a victory, and a baptism. Um, so that's the narrative over here. Constantine and his victory and legalization of Christianity. And they're framed in by Corinthian columns. You can see these are Corinthian columns. And the other side has also got Corinthian columns on it. And I said to you that these, this side is about his mother. So... His mother was a saint, and she's said to have found the true cross on a trip to Jerusalem. And so from the bottom up, we have the story of her searching for the cross. And then on a hill of Calvary, there's three crosses that were dug up from the ground, excavated. So she's searching to excavated. And then this one up here is the talking about what's said to be the miracle of the true cross enacted where the crosses are held over the body of a dead boy and the true cross restores him to life. So see how there's extra ones in this one? So that's what's going on in that side. 
Now, the interesting thing about the other, about the middle part is that we have a kind of a couple little triptychs. See how we have three panels, one, two, three? Well, inside each of these have little miniature triptychs. See? One, two, three. And they kind of almost echo the middle sections bigger, like this is bigger than these. And it almost like echoes this inside of it two times. So that's pretty interesting. So let's look a little bit about, look a little bit into the detail of these and what's going on here. So from them being in the middle, we can tell obviously that they're more important, right? Um, we've been seeing a lot of times over and over again that things on the right of a holy figure like Christ mean good things and the left is bad or place of honor, less honor, things like that. So we have that going on with positioning of things in space. Well, in this, the middle part is most important. It's larger, it's different. These are the doors. This is the main focal point of it. So the smaller one at the top here in the middle is said to hold a piece of what's the true cross. So um, it's called that inside the crucifixion is a small recess. See that? That's a little crucifixion scene with a silk pouch that holds what they say to be a piece of the true cross that was found by Constantine's mother. Um, and then on each side of the middle of this is pictures of uh, the narrative where St. John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, are on each side of him when, he's, when Christ is being crucified. So that's the kind of narrative happening here. And you get with a sun and a moon over the cross as well, which is talking about like the earth going dark during that time. And also in some way, the divinity of Jesus as well. They're talking about that type of idea that they have, that they believe. Um, the people who made this, why, what they're communicating to us. The larger of the three uh, tip dip triptychs three panels try is depicts the cross with constantine and his mother and then two archangels above and four saints so that's what's going on in this one right here let's see if we can have a closer look i don't know if i have an image of this closer i couldn't you can't find a lot of close-up images of some of these things yeah unfortunately I don't in this slide but you have constantine his mother archangels and then we have saints around about so we're having a repetition constantine his mother his mother constantine the saints there's a cross here and a cross here so something being higher up is more important um so you get a lot of that type of stuff what other kind of symbolism do we have here? Well, we have three panels, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's talking about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. So they're using three for that reason. There's the circles of the rondolas are talking about symbolism of the unending. So not ending circle is the idea of they use this in wedding bands, right? Um, a non-ending band being a sign of connect commitment. Well, it's the idea of the unending or universal church, recognizing the person who legalized Christianity and the person who found the true cross. That's what they're talking about there. Um, the precious stones in it are symbolism of the value of the relic for them, right? What's well, important. And then in some way, also, this is all about, like I said, the way of trying to establish Savila as a place, it's important holy site like Rome and Jerusalem. So there's Constantine's mom is in Jerusalem when she finds the true cross, so that's Jerusalem. And then Rome, because Constantine is in Rome when he defeats, and he has the battle on the bridge, and he's a Roman emperor. So there's very much strong, strong ideas here, like we talked about. See in this like how chapters 10 and 11 are filtering down and a lot of the conversation we had in those ones is, is being seen here. And the ground I set with a lot of, you know, introduction of um, different ideas and the worldview is continuing on in these, in these chapters as well. 
Okay, so we're going to look, move on from this onto um, another cathedral and a scene of Last Judgment, which was common to put over the portals of cathedrals. This is St. Lazare in Autun, Burgundy, France, also Romanesque cathedral. Burgundy's up here. Our last one was down here, so this is the area right here we're talking about in France. And we're going to look especially at the portal in this of this cathedral. So it's a beautiful cathedral. It has a lot of the same features. The front towers, the crossing tower, the apse. But what's interesting about it in comparison is this scene above the portal. It's similar in that it's it conforms to our same type of ideas like we had in the last one I talked to you about the sort of norms on these. Well, the Last Judgment, this tympanum, is that's the tympanum, Last Judgment scene. This is common to have above the portals of um, Romanesque churches, okay? But this cathedral, this one has a difference that's important is that it's dedicated, not dedicated, it was carved, the sculptor was Gisalbertus, so we actually know who the artist was. And the last one, if you remember, that we didn't know who the artist was, it was just made by some artisan. We didn't have a particular, there was no name associated with it, right? So we're on, we're into a different territory here with like having something where we know who the artist is, which is pretty rare from this era. Now, the cathedral is dedicated to Lazarus, St. Lazarus. It's also called Atong Cathedral, not just St. Lazare, St. Lazarus. And I think this is an interesting sculpture because it shows the rebirth that's beginning, that's been happening and continuing on of monumental stone sculpture during this period of time, a really large sculpture. You have to think that to be able to do things on this scale and size and this monumentally requires um, a lot of time and money and it has to have some kind of peaceful, stable society to be able to pull off things like giant cathedral building projects that would take like the lifetime of a person. So. There's a different kind of um, vibe going on in society with with these monarchies and the money and the way that the power was set up. They could actually have these really long projects. Gisalbertus is the only sculptor to inscribe his name, the only one to ever inscribe his name on the tympanum of a Romanesque church. So very rare also. Not a lot is known about him, but his distinctive his actual personal life, we don't know really very much of anything about him, but his distinctive style influenced a lot of other sculptors. So we definitely have seen his influence artistically. And the portal of this cathedral, the opening the doors, are very similar to the last one we saw. They're the same type of um, exact labeling of things, right? The doors. We have the jams, the tympanum, all these things, right? So it's broken up the, the same way. And we're going to look in detail about his style and the details of this particular place. But I kind of want to show you before that some other pieces he's known for. These are the capitals um, depicting the flight into Egypt. So Mary and Joseph. Um, Sir Jesus survives being murdered by um, Herod, and they're later worried about his life. So their flight into Egypt means they're leaving to go where they'll be safe in Egypt, and so he won't be um, killed. And they have, you can see in his style, there's this mandorlos over the heads of holy figures. The clothing is very... Um, stylized see this is in the last judgment as well you can kind of see the stylization of the wrinkle in the clothing and the patterning happening we also have sort of like a weightlessness in both of them see how they feel like they're almost floating up they don't have a lot of weight in them um this one on the capital is kind of a child who looks a little bit like a little man this is common for jesus in this era when he's a child 
but he's the feeling of Mary isn't supporting his weight. Um, so that's interesting. Also on the tympanum here, there's that same feeling of him being weightless in the center of it. There's a similarity to the figures. There's naturalism, but not realistic. There's kind of an elongation to things, and in certain ways, kind of a roundness and elongation. So you can feel like things are stretched out some of the time in his style. Let's go looking back at looking at the actual um, the actual tympanum here for a second. See the best picture of it. I guess this is our. Uh, this is the best one I have, unfortunately. It's hard to get good pictures of it, but it's a doorway of a cathedral, right? So the functionality is the same. It's meant to be the main doorway. And it's all that composition around it, too. Okay. And again, like the last piece, the sculpture is meant to communicate with an illiterate population. And it's the same type of reminder that the last judgment is a reminder of the brevity of life, how quick life goes by, which we all know about. And even COVID-19, we're even more aware of that in a way sometimes. But with this, they're also the builders, Gizelbertus commissioned to make this. They're trying to communicate the idea of um, how your choices have uh, consequences to them at the end of a life. And there's an idea of punishment and reward that they're communicating. It's made out of stone, and there's a really a, kind of a beautiful quality to the surface design in Gisalbertus' work. And there was a taste for this in Romanesque sculpture. See how there's all these detailed things around, and then this cloak and drapery. A really careful detail there. Um, Christ is a kind of like appearing like he's in majestic light. He has the big halo over his head. There is also on it around him um, different types of angels, and then we get the idea of the judgment happening here. But we can we can kind of get into this in just a second when we look at the detail shots of it, right? But I have this idea I want to show you is this big oval type of shape, like he's bathed in light, he's in the center, he's the most important figure here, the judge. And you can kind of see from this angle how there's a lot of elongation and the people are getting flatter, I mean rounder and elongated. It's the same idea in the last one on his right and on his left. Okay, so the same same exact type of thing is being communicated here. So there's another important idea here is that um, his arms are extended wide open to kind of welcome people to the cathedral. So there's meant to be a welcoming arms, like divine presence and welcoming people to pilgrims to the cathedral. There's a zigzag repeating motif on his drapery. He draws attention to him. And there's a lot of a pattern effect on things more than like actual reality. So this, we're going to look at some of these details and things that look pretty interesting. There's over here, this is on, let's see if you can see. This is this part of it that we're going to look at right here. Over here on that section is the idea of Michael the Archangel. He is weighing souls. So this is interesting. He's bending down, you can see him bending down, to weigh souls. And there's these kind of figures beautifully made to kind of be grasping onto him in his cloak down there. They're kind of like looking for help, clinging to him for protection. And you can see that he's really large, right? The people, these are people. He's really large because he's an archangel. And... These two devils over here, these are meant to be devils, and this devil over here. There's an idea of a scale. Do you see that how there's a scale? Like a basic scale going here, whatever's heavier or lighter. They're on the other side, the damned side, so to speak. 
that's what they would call it. Um, and this is a metaphor that's happening here for not a realistic gravity, but it is a metaphor that's happening disregarding how gravity is and how things work in that way. Um, of course, not necessarily concerning figures and things and depictions with what you could observe in life. So they're using gravity in a um, conceptual way. What do I mean by that? You're like, uh, I don't know what you're trying to say. Well, what I'm trying to say is that gravity and physical weight and weightlessness are becoming metaphors for spirituality and salvation. And there's a sort of irony here that the saved, which these guys are over here trying to pull this thing down to make this person go up, the saved person here weighs more because they have more spiritual substance. Okay, so this weighing here is a total metaphor for um, spiritual substance. So if it, a soul weighs more, it's more full of substance, so that means that they go up because the damned in this situation go down because they have less substance. So what's happening? These uh, devils are trying to pull on it so that this person looks like they don't weigh as much and they're damned. So there's definitely the idea that they're trying to populate hell here. Um, it's very strongly being depicted. Okay? See the close up here of the sculpture. And it's been broken up, but that's it's missing some pieces, but you get the ideas even closer up when you look at it. And you have some of the similar type of ideas happening, the jaws of death, the gates of hell, people being um, pushed down there, see the context. On the other side, we have, you know, positive things happening. So very strong, very strong metaphors happening here. And using weights and weightlessness and substantial qualities of things and sort of weightlessness to be the idea of spiritual light, all these type of things are happening. So it's a um, very, very conceptual approach to the figure and depicting space in that way. Very beautiful style that Gizelbert has. I really, you can see like all the detail in the drapery, that surface detail in the zigzagging patterning of the wings and Michael the Archangel. A lot, a lot of details going on here. So we're going to move on to a different object that um, is unlike other objects we've seen before. Because it's not made out of stone or wood or something like that. It's a tapestry, and I don't think we've seen any tapestries in the course up until now. So maybe I showed you the Tarkanian dress, the oldest dress in the world, but it's not in your book. We haven't seen a lot of things made out of cloth. And the other thing that's unusual about this is it's actually a non-religious non imagery in an event that's not religious, which is pretty unusual for this time period. A lot of things we've looked at have some sort of philosophical, religious um, significance to the people, right? We've seen time and time again in these, in the chapters, that a huge theme in art, you know, for centuries that we've been talking about, has been about, um, you know, life after death or religion or an ideal. Besides that, one of our other themes has been grandeur and power and kingly power, right? And then we've had early on some ideas of fertility, gods and goddesses, and, you know, finding, uh, trying to appease the gods and goddesses and have success in hunting or crops or things like that. Um, and then we've seen a lot of rituals. And so, you know, the things that maybe close, the most closely relate to this would be ideas of like Hadrian, um, his scroll that's unrolling, like the big tower showing his battle, his victory, right? There's like some amount of like they're trying to historically capture things. Well, this is the same type of object. It's actually trying to cap 
um, capture a narrative, a long narrative here about a historical event from the perspective of the Normans. There was a, William the Conqueror is was a um, king who invaded England. So there was a Norman invasion, N-O-R-M-A-N invasion of England. And this would have been about the events up to and including what's called the Battle of Hastings. Um, this was probably originally hung in the nave, which remembers Long Central Isle of Bayou Cathedral, or maybe in the Great Hall of the Palace um, building that was made by William the Conqueror. Some people put this as one of the first graphic narratives, like modern graphic novels. And a few books, if you're into graphic novels, there's different histories about that. Some people would consider this the first one, um, or one of the early ones. There's some ideas and style that's probably related a little bit to illuminated, ma illuminated manuscripts, like the way borders are done. We can see some of their common style things happening. And there's a only a limited color palette because of the type of thread they have. And there's interesting line work. This is all sewn by hand, little stitches. Uh, beautiful. And a lot of detail in it. There's like people and animals all in the borders. And they have these kind of trees. I don't know if I have any good pictures of the trees. They use like things like trees or towers like this to be kind of the break of the scene. So that's why a lot of people relate it to like com graphic novels, which are like longer comics, because it's sort of the panel, the change of action between the panels. So we're supposed to read this as like scenes of action and snippets of it, sort of the way they've broken it up. It's really, really long. And you can see like each one's kind of a scene happening. Um, so the basics of, we know like a lot about this specifically because there was the idea of they're loading the ships, unloading them, preparing. Someone told them that William's coming. Harold was his uh, the opposer, the guy who was coming against him. So Edward the Confessor had was the king of England, and he had no son. And his nephew was Duke William of Normandy, so he was in northern France. He was chosen to be his successor. And then Harold, this guy here, you see some of their names sometimes are are um, spelled out and there's Latin inscriptions in some spots, was um, sent by Edward to tell William that he was um, supposed to be king and he swore allegiance to William. He told his, his boss, the king, that he would do it. But then once Edward died, the king died, he tried to seize the throne. So it was a bit of a snake, right? And William raised an army so they got their boats ready to sail. They're unloading their boats. He raised a big army full of mighty warriors, you know, so to speak, and met them at the Battle of Hastings, which he was told they're coming. So this is Harold getting it going. Oh, no, people are coming. We're going to go out to battle. Well, this is the Battle of Hastings scene. Um, and in this, Harold died in the fight in William I. And for the next 300 years, Norman kings ruled England. So Normandy is part of northern France. The kings of northern France ruled England. We know when the Battle of Hastings was, so this is very interesting historically because we have like a specific date even that the Battle of Hastings was, which is pretty, you know, a lot of things we've had we've been like circa this between these dates. We're not like very specific about it. So that's because we're dealing with a you know, time periods where we don't always know, like, we're guessing based on things. We don't know the history, the record isn't really there. But it was October 14th, we can get down to the day, 1066. So that was the Battle of Hastings. And this is a detail, the battle seems a little bigger, but this is a detail of it. You can see kind of detail it has shields and the kind of weaponry they had, and horseback, and then there's things down here like, a guy who was defeated without his head, fallen warriors, spear guys, you know, there's a lot of, and there's bits of Latin that are inscriptions about kind of what's happening. So there were 400 years of um, 
there were 400 years of 300 years sorry of Norman kings after this so that's is a big battle in the history of England I skipped it when I undid that there we go there's more details of the scene so important important event in the history of England there um, to be having Norman kings over them but you can see like the horses falling over people dying this is really pretty pretty specific you know with even the style of armor and things to think about all this is sewn embroidered thread which is a lot of work if any of you have ever done embroidery before it's that's a lot of work it's on linen and it would have been the, the work mostly done by women so um someone would have designed it but the women they would have employed women to do it i don't know how much they would have paid them um back then it wasn't really fair in those ways um there was colored wool this is the wool thread that's dyed and then colored um dyed and then made into um thread and it's 230 feet long wow and it's two feet tall, so two feet tall by 230 feet, a giant thing. And on it, there's 626 humans depicted, 731 animals, 375 boats. And then we're talking about a serious amount of stuff. 70 buildings and trees, animals all over the place. Look at all these animals. Um, it's interesting because it uses a lot of it has like a flat space to it, right? If you see here, the depth, things aren't getting too much bigger or smaller. These are borders, so they're smaller. But the way they show depth is overlap. And there's not really a feeling of the ground. It's kind of like a weird, there's the shelf of this, like the borders, but we're supposed to know there's ground, but it's not exactly always specific. And the ground is just a wavy line. There it is, that's the ground, okay? There's real and imaginary animals up here. So you see like a bird and then we have like griffins and dragons and things like that. Um, lions and different type of things on the border on the top and the bottom. And then they have like, they're using in this a lot of design elements like diagonals to make it very interesting action. So you have a kind of a feeling of the tumble jumble. And they use this to like make the action more interesting, the way they jumble it up together, which makes it more interesting to look at. There's very limited color palette and hundreds of figures. So there's even detail down to like 230 feet. You'd think, okay, give up some of the detail, two feet large. There's so much detail, even down to eyes, eyebrows, and this is armor, and a tiny little seam. Uh, so crazy, crazy detail that's um this armor and these weapons are consistent with the time that it was made in so a very realistic feeling and then the boats they show in it let's go back to the boats sort of here you can see them uh, there's not a lot of great there's one that's what i was looking for um are kind of scandinavian in origin there's this feeling of the beasts of war on the whole of them these are the normans would have been using boats that were similar to like the vikings would have been using scandinavian we saw these type of a boat burial with one of these type of boats in our purse cover of sutton who if you remember so these are the type of boats they would have had there's a lot of symbolism throughout this um this is the scene important scene of harold being killed so if you think about it there's a powerful narrative that's being happening here right 230 feet of this giant narrative what is the ultimate narrative though the bigger narrative this is all the details showing how they he was the traitor he was supposed to get william he didn't get william william was told and he came and harold went out to fight him and he was defeated and he died right the guy who wasn't supposed to be king that's the idea the worthy success for successor of the throne, William the Conqueror, is the one who's supposed to be the winner. He's the worthy successor, right? Because he was he killed the guy who tried to jip him out of it, who was a snaky guy who promised one thing and did another, right? So there's a really powerful narrative that is 
trying to last, they're trying to get something that would last through history, right? A really long lasting narrative. They've taken all this time to have people do this and spend this much time and energy and the wealth to be able to do this and gather the people to do this. You try doing one person, just imagine if one person tried to do a 230 foot tapestry, two feet high. Uh, that would be crazy like that would be a lifelong project not literally but we're talking like crazy so there's a lot of people working on this right so it's very strong narrative this is really interesting object that I find it really interesting and I like the um, different ways they incorporate strangely Latin inscriptions into it and you have things like arrows coming out of this shield in the ground it's very kind of uh has a very specific style that's kind of swirly whirly because of the embroidery as well because the way that thread responds to cloth and the way you can't exactly get a perfectly straight line very easily right because so it because the embroidery um might be straight on the cloth but the cloth moves and it kind of has sagging and any of you ever done sewing and things like that you would understand that idea so what I want to do now is I posted a page that shows the entire Bayou Tapestry, all of it from start to finish, in a narrated way. It's on this, this website here, but you don't have to worry about finding it by writing down this link because I'll show you what I did. Hold for one second. I'm going to pause and pull something up. So when you go into your dashboard or uh, the course on Canvas, the home page, you'll have Romanes chapter 12 will be one of the modules and this will be the video lecture where I'll be posting it and then below it you'll see Bayou Tapestry video. Click inside of that and it'll take you here to watch from the end to the start of it. This is, it's loaded up on YouTube and you'll be able to watch it. It's kind of fun because it has a... Tapestry story starts in 1064 with this man, Edward the Confessor. Who is clearly very important as he gets the So it has a narrative that's British guy, kind of funny, Monty Python esque, and it labels things and points things out to you and says funny jokes about it a little bit. It's cheesy, but it's pretty awesome. Biggest and most elaborate depiction of any character in the tapestry. Sitting here with his crown and scepter, and generally being King of England, but at this point having no heirs, he's having a talk to presumably Harold and a companion in what we think is Westminster Palace. Okay, so the whole thing goes through like that, like being clearly explaining the history of it. And I, it's really interesting. I want you to watch it. It's 200, I mean, 222 minutes long, worth a watch, very funny. Um, and it'll help you understand a bit more of it as well. So that's that, that you should watch after you're done with this video lecture. So once you're done watching that, then we'll be done with chapter um, 12. So that puts you, you know, a couple hours worth of lecture and video. I'm going to post a couple, another small documentary about the era. And then you're going to want to keep looking at, you're going to want to look at your, um, if you look at module 11, early middle ages chapter for a module, module here for chapter 11, I should say, there's a slide list and vocabulary here for this last test, which would be chapters 11, 12, and 13. So the next, the last test is the last one of the semester, and it's all these chapters. You'll find, you know, all the things like we've been talking about. There's the slide list and the vocabulary for all this. So some of these things you won't know at first because they're for chapter 13. But we've looked at if you've watched, been watching, you've already watched 11 and 12, so we have one more chapter left to go on this. And you're going to want to study this over and look at it and, you know, look in your book and do the reading. Of course, you want to do the reading for the chapter that we're covering and not just, um, that's all part of your in-class instruction time as well. So we're definitely doing all of our hours through all that stuff. So I hope you guys are taking care out there and staying safe. Um, Take care of yourselves. If you have questions, please feel free to email me. I've had people emailing me, so just make sure you do. If you have questions, I want to answer them for you. All right, talk to you later.